Hello, I'm Dave Kavarek, Metallurgist and Failure Analyst at NSL Analytical Services. Today, I'll give a general overview of failure analysis. Many of you listening are likely in the business, and I hope this talk gives you a few extra talking points and a look at a case study. If you're new to failure analysis, this will give you an overview to the process, first company issues, then the tests used, then I'll finish with a case study. I need to acknowledge NSL here because they provided quite a bit of the data. NSL is a full service chemical and metallurgical lab. We have two labs, about 10 minutes apart. One that is primarily for the first two columns on the list, which is chemical analysis, and the one that I'm in, which is primarily for metallurgical analysis. We both can consult depending on the topic. The first part concerns itself with the beginnings of a failure analysis. The company first needs to determine whether it's worth the effort. If you're inside the organization, it usually starts with a phone call to you or someone else in the organization that calls you, customer, VP, plant manager, or maintenance guy. My experience, and here's rule number one, if you're inside the organization, you can't knee jerk your way through this and throw a possible answer out because you end up spending a lot more time on it later. It's really tempting just to get it off your desk. Sometimes you have to say something no matter what, but please just don't throw out your first thought. I know of a large multinational company that sold another large multinational company some parts of their building and one exploded when it powered up and my boss was called and was asked if they had to evacuate the building. The effects are real, sometimes not easily quantified. It can affect the efficiency of your process, the company image, costs, sales, and safety. You have to determine what the effect is and whether fixing it is worth the effort to analyze it. The type most people think about first is if, if the product failure occurs in the field. You'll need a lot of communication with your customer. You may lose confidence in you. Some customers are more forgiving than others. From here on, we'll just assume that your company has decided that it needs to be investigated. We come to rule number two. Get, get as much background information as you can and know that you are unlikely to get all the information that you're going to need. If you're trying to analyze a failure from a part in service, it's very helpful to know out front the material specifications, what the material was supposed to be, by trying to see what it was supposed to look like, what it was supposed to do, what was the loading supposed to be, and then the actual temperatures, pressures, and loads that it saw, asking particularly about fluctuating loads and how long it's been in service and whether it was consistent or just intermittent service. I'd ask what environment it was in, looking for possible corrosion issues. I used, I, one of the failures I worked on was from some forklifts that was in Minnesota with corroding electrical boxes underneath. And it turns out that parts were being carried between two buildings across the parking lot. It was corroding because of the salt that was being used on the parking lot. You ask about anything unusual that might have occurred. Rule number three. First thing you tell everyone is to preserve the parts. Fracture services are very important to give the analyst a lot of information. If you're the one that gets the broken parts, even though it's really tempting to put the two halves of part together when, after it broke, don't do it. Don't torch it off unless you know exactly where to do that because the heat will change the microstructure. Most of the failures an analyst will see are broken up into, into five general types. Overload, fatigue, an environmental cause, generally corrosion, or in material processing, or wear. There are a lot of variations and combinations on all of these things. The analyst needs to get to the bottom line. Why did it happen, and how do I keep it from happening again? Now we come to rule four. Always do the non-destructive testing first. There's no way to go back from destructive testing, and almost always, you only get one chance in a part. So you need to be sure you get all the information you can before you destroy the part. And rule number five, before we start getting into details, all the data from testing needs to fit the conclusion. You cannot pick and choose from the data that you get from the tests that you get. Things are not always as they first appear. The largest percentage of what I see are single event overload failures. Visual examination can give you clues. Shape of the craft relative to the load gives you your first clue as to whether the part failed in a ductile or brittle manner. One of the easiest things to picture are bars or shafts, and I borrowed a schematic to show here. 
in tension, ductal fractures typically have shear lifts at a 45 degree angle to the load with a flat area that is perpendicular to the load. Brittle failure does not have shear areas. In torsion, a ductal failure is perpendicular to the loading, whereas a brittle failure fails at a 45 degree angle as shown in the center part. To figure out why, you have to go back to your mechanical engineering books. In compression, a ductal piece shown on the right will barrel out, maybe flatten like a pancake, sometimes split perpendicular to the axis if it splits at all. A brittle fracture shows vertical cracks. I'll quickly go over here some of the destructive tests that an analyst will do. First four here, chemical analysis, SEM-EDS, metallography and hardness, either micro or macro, are common tests that are performed, but there are many tests available, which corrosion and tensile are the most common, but they are dependent on the circumstances of the failure and how much material is available. Although many people would, be, would put the SEM under non-destructive category, I put it in the usually destructive category since most of the time you have to cut the piece up to examine it. Chemical analysis is important here because it gives the analyst a baseline to work from. You may know what it's supposed to be, but you can make a lot of assumptions based on chemistry and you might be wrong. These are SEM images of typical ductal dimpling in a ductal fracture on the left and the flat river patterns typical of a brittle transgranular fracture on the right. If a part fails, most of the time you want it to be in a ductal manner so it gives some warning by bending or stretching before it fails. There are two general types of brittle fractures, transgranular across the grains like this one or intergranular at grain boundaries. Here you can see the river patterns and not the grain boundaries. Here's a couple of fatigue failures out of the handbooks. In real life, they're very rarely this pretty. They don't have little arrows showing where the origin is. And many times, fatigue striations don't look as nice as they do here. If you need a chemical analysis of a very small area, EDS can be used. Occasionally, the analyst will see inclusions or foreign material at the origin of the failure particularly fatigue failures, and EDS can be used to identify what the inclusion is made of. For those who aren't familiar with it, EDS is energy dispersive spectroscopy. Many SEMs have this capability. It's a technique used for getting the elemental analysis from a very small area of a sample, and here's an example of it. This is the output from our EDS, which is typical of most EDS units. You get a plot of counts in it versus energy in KEV, which identifies the element. These are EDS results of an alumina inclusion embedded in a steel fracture. Percentages you get are corrected for atomic number and so on. You can do quantitative measurements if you have material standards, but we, like most places, use the standard list version and use the calculations. But this is not a bulk analysis. Bulk analyses like ICP or XRF get information from a much larger volume of sample. EDS can give you an idea of the chemical analysis because it's near the surface, but it's a very small amount of material and it's not a certification. Corrosion is a large topic and many people and organizations devote their whole careers to it. In analyzing a failure, most of the time being able to recognize visually the different types of corrosion is the first step. The mode of failure can be a combination of corrosion and something else like erosion or fatigue or overload. As an analyst, all you can visually see is the result of the corrosion. I listed most of the corrosion types here, uniform, pitting, crevice, filiform about exfoliation, so on, and the effects they have. Localized attack by pitting, bulk material loss by galvanic or exfoliation, general roughening, uniform, filiform or fretting, and lower fatigue life, such as from notch formation, stress corrosion cracking, or crevice. I'll go over a couple of these. Visual examination is always first and most important. The photo on the left is from a 7079 T6 aluminum alloy landing gear actuator. The fracture is initiated at the interior edges of the bolt holes, where the arrows are on this photo, where the clevis was attached. In this case, the cause was stress corrosion cracking. This is the photo here on the left. You can see the chevrons pointing toward the initiation sites. Galvanic corrosion is pretty common, as in the second photo. In a generic sense, it's a general corrosion near the juncture of two dissimilar metals. The worst situation is large cathode, small anode, 
needs an electrolyte, but there's usually water around with some ions and chlorides in it. You don't need much. The photo here is someone's car it's with painted steel with stainless steel wheel coverings that has galvanic corrosion along the edges of the steel. Thermal fatigue is only in places where the parts saw significant changes in temperature, like die casting dies. You typically see a lot of cracking on the surface, like on this part on the right. Most of the time it's called heat checking. Now I'll talk about where metallography can help determine the type of corrosion failure. Regarding thermal fatigue, we do microstructure through the crack usually has a carrot kind of look, like here on the left. Sometimes the crack down the middle, sometimes not, and that's oxide in the middle. I've only seen exfoliation in aluminum like in the center photo. In heat treated 2024, the copper aluminum precipitates can line up and form galvanic cells with the aluminum between it and, the, and it corrodes the aluminum in sheets. I've only seen this twice in real life. I've seen the aluminum propellers on European firefighting planes that were parked in the seacoast. On the right is an example of internet granular corrosion. Aluminum is anodic to almost all the other metals, so galvanic action drives a lot of corrosion issues with aluminum. You can see things like intergranular cracking that's shown in the slide on the far right there. If there's segregation of elements like copper to the grain boundaries, because you can get galvanic cells between the grain boundaries and the base aluminum. I wanted to touch on processing here. Most of the time, such as with laths and seams and quench cracks and steel rods, metallography is a very typical way of determining what the issues are. This is aluminum casting on the left. Metallography showed a couple of issues. Porosity is common in a casting, but unfortunately the porosity was concentrated here in the area of the highest stress. Complicating the issue was a cold chug, which is where the molten metal comes in from one side from the mold, solidifies, and the metal comes in from the other side and solidifies against it, which is shown there on the right. Regarding wear, most wear is pretty easy to identify, like the scraping on the left. Fretting is a particular type of wear on the right and somewhat more complicated. Fretting occurs when you have two surfaces that are locked together and are in opposite motion and just vibration is enough. The designer usually considers them fixed, so they're not, for, they're not expected to wear. If it ends up as a fatigue failure, like in the photo on the right, the crack starts in the abraded area in this area, in this case, it's on the top of the photo. Before we get to a case that I looked at, this is a famous failure that people have heard about but don't often get to see photos of. This is from the study of the 1953-1954 de Havilland Comet failure, which is the first airplane made to carry commercial passengers, and these failures resulted in all the windows and future airplanes being round or oval. A couple of the comets failed in the air catastrophically over the North Atlantic, and in studying the failure, they built a full-scale hydrostatic pressure tester to simulate what's going on, and you can see that in the lower left where they put a cage around the fuselage to catch all the pieces. The fuselage had about 1,200 service cycles and it failed about a few over the 1,800 more pressurization cycles. It turns out that pressurization and depressurization of the cabin, which hadn't been taken into consideration originally, caused fatigue cracking initiating at the corners of the windows. And now we'll talk about a case study that we did at NSL. We studied some ring electrical connections from a heating application, and we were asked to determine whether the electrical parts had overheated. Visually, not a lot to see. Fatigue was unlikely because of the application. The fracture was on the washer section, so that's where we concentrated our efforts. We took a look at the washer surface in the SEM EDS, but we didn't see much. The washer surface had a lot of tin, zinc, fluorine, carbon, and oxygen on it. The washer was likely tin plated, so that wasn't surprising. The fluorine, carbon, and oxygen were probably from the melted plastic. The SEM EDS of the washer fracture surface wasn't much help either. The fracture surface looked pretty mangled and deformed, likely from after the fracture, so it didn't look like we'd get much from looking at the fracture surface. This is one of those cases where metallography told a much better story. The failed rings were slightly less hard than the used rings, but not enough to say whether the heat had caused a difference. This is the cross-section of the failed ring. You can see the tin plate fractured in spots and the rough surface. It's hard to tell the darkened area was the way the tin was plated or not. We did metallography to the barrel of the connector that was still attached to the, to the wires. You can see on the left 
the crank of the barrel around the wires, the brass sections, and the crushed wires. The composition of the gray areas was about 40 copper, 40 tin, and 20 zinc, which we found by doing SEM EDS on the mound. So you can see in the right photo, the original mag on the right is double that, the one on the left. You can see that the copper, tin, zinc appears to have melted, judging the dendritic structure and the porosity. If you go back to the books, there's a ternary eutectic at 446F in the high tin area, slightly below the melting point of tin, which is 449 and a half. We knew that, that the connection got at least that hot. Now, the five, my five rules of failure analysis. Don't just throw an answer out. Get as much background information as you can and know that you're not unlikely to get it all. Preserve the parts. Always do the non-destructive testing first, and all the data from the testing needs to support your conclusions. Thank you for your attention, and we'll now entertain questions. <laughs>